So, I'm assuming most everybody watching this video is a guitarist, ukulelist, bassist, or some other fretted instrumentalist. And you know, as devoted as we all may be to playing, we do have lives outside of our instruments. Some of us enjoy woodworking, or maybe an occasional pickup game of basketball. I enjoy cooking. Some people like to fiddle with your car engines. Well, you get the idea. We all do things outside of uh, our playing. And no matter how much we take care of our hands while playing and practicing, injuries have a tendency to happen when we engage in our other pursuits. So what happens when you jam your fretting hand ring finger playing basketball and you have a big gig coming up on the weekend? Can you still play and earn that big gig paycheck? Well, I say yes. Let's talk about the Django rule. So, who is Django and why does he matter to our conversation? Well, since there's a lot of biographical information on Django Reinhardt on the web, I'll let you make your own deep dive into his life and career. And to save some time, I'll just give you a thumbnail view of why Django is so important. Django Reinhardt was a Belgian gypsy guitarist who as a young man suffered severe burns to his left hand, rendering his ring and little finger essentially useless. So what did he do? Well, quite simply, he proceeded to become one of the most influential jazz and swing guitarists of the mid 20th century. And using mostly just the index and middle fingers of his left hand, he developed a technique which allowed him to play sinuous scalar lines, jagged and angular arpeggiated runs, and most stunningly, well, to me anyway, he developed a very sophisticated chord melody style. Now, I say he used mostly his index and middle fingers, but if you look at some of the pictures of him and watch some of the available video clips of him playing, and believe it or not, there's not a lot, Occasionally, you can see his ring finger kind of briefly come into play. He might kind of knuckle it over. Um, the point is, he persevered. He used all of his available resources and he overcame what was essentially a career ending injury. In fact, there's an entire genre of music named after his legacy, Gypsy Jazz. So check this out. In the late 60s, a young guitarist from Birmingham, England, lost a portion of his right index and middle fingertips in an accident involving a steel press. Well, sometime later, one of his friends laid a Django record on him and told him all about Django's story. Well, this young guitarist was so inspired by both the story and by what he heard on that record that he ended up fashioning some false fingertips from a plastic bottle, which he melted and made little thimbles out of to fit over his fingertips. And uh, he also used some strips of fabric, which he had cut from a suede jacket, glued them onto those little thimbles. And he proceeded to, well, relearn how to play guitar, but he also proceeded to create heavy metal. And for those of you who might be thinking, wait a minute, this story sounds familiar. You're right. This young guitarist was Tony Iommi from Black Sabbath. So you might be thinking, well, what does this have to do with you and me and, uh, you know, normal people. We, we're probably not going to be creating entire genres of jazz or entire genres of rock music. Well, for me, this is actually very personal. Um, for me, my injury was developing carpal tunnel syndrome in my left hand. And it started when I was getting my senior recital ready at the University of Miami in 1994. Um, I was preparing the Moreno Toroba Sonatina in A, um, John Dwart's transcription of Bach's Cello Suite No. 1, um, Isaac Albena's, uh, his piece Granada, and uh, lots of others. But quite simply, the closer I got to my recital, the more I entered panic mode. And I became so panicked that I would just jump straight into practicing the pieces themselves without warming up properly. And this was the beginning of my injury. Well, long story short, I had issues with pain and or numbness in my thumb and forefinger for years. Um, it finally got so bad, I couldn't play classical guitar for more than 15 minutes at a stretch, so I've stopped. Um, but I was able to continue playing electric and acoustic guitar because there was no opposition of the thumb and uh, forefinger because you can hold the guitar like this. But eventually, even playing electric or steel string acoustic became problematic. And by this time, I was a full-time gigging bluegrass musician who was actually faced with the possibility that I might not be able to continue playing. 
thereby losing my livelihood. So there I was, unable to play, and if I couldn't earn any money, I couldn't pay for my last resort treatment option, which was surgery. So <laughs> I figured, well, hey, I can play a little bit of slide. I have a dobro, and you know what? Gravity does half the work. So over a gigless weekend, I learned enough about the dobro to play chords and uh, still sing while I was doing this new thing. And after about three weeks of gigging playing the dobro, I had even started soloing. Now, granted, it wasn't great, but it scratched that textural bluegrass itch. Eventually, though, I got to where I couldn't even hold the steel between my thumb and middle finger anymore. And I still had three to four gigs left to make the balance of my surgery money. So I did this. And yes, this is probably the most horrible picture of me in existence, but it worked. And all we did was we gaffer taped um, the steel to my finger so I didn't have to exert that kind of pressure. So I paid for the surgery and uh, three weeks after the surgery, the doctor told me to resume playing in lieu of uh, physical therapy. My hand is good as new now. And as a result, I take warming up very, very, very seriously. So I thought in order to uh, give a little extra value to this video um, and to keep it from just being an inspirational video, um, I thought that I would give you a brief overview of how I worked out a way to keep playing despite not being able to really hold chord grips on the guitar anymore. And as I mentioned a little earlier, I had learned to play some, a bit of slide um, with some help from my dear friend Smiling Bob Lewis. Now, I wasn't an amazing slide player, but I could navigate around fairly well in these G-derived shapes. Now let's think about this for a second. If we play a G chord, notice that the fourth, third, and second strings are open, which gives us a G chord. Okay, if I transpose this up to the fifth fret, it's a C. And if I transpose it up to the seventh fret, it's a D. And then if I take it up to the 12th fret, the octave, well, then of course that takes me back to a G. And so the things that I had worked out were lines that kind of were like this. And uh, so my big problem now was how to take what I knew about the guitar, these chord shapes on the guitar, and translate it to the dobro, which is tuned totally differently. Now, we all know the guitar in standard tuning is E, A, D, G, B, and E. And the dobro in standard bluegrass tuning is G, B, D, G, B, Sorry about the rattling, I need to tighten the cone up a little bit, and I literally have not played this thing in five years, so it needs a setup. Also, don't judge me on my playing ability either. So just how do we reconcile this tuning mess? Well, have you spotted the solution yet? I'll give you a second to think it over. So right, both instruments have um, D, G, and B, as the fourth, third, and second strings, meaning anything I was able to do on those strings of the guitar would translate by a one-to-one -one ratio to the dobro. So some of the lines that I played earlier on the guitar are things like this. One of the things that I could do is I could translate some of the songs I knew into kind of a different picking style where I could go, Dooley was a good old man who lived below the mill. Dooley had two daughters and a forty gallon still. So this was what was able to keep me playing 
um, and I could still play and sing at the same time and uh, not feel like I was useless up on the bandstand. Now, after I got used to this a little bit, I could start playing things like... So what I could do is I could elaborate on some of these formations. Again, don't judge me on my playing, it's pretty horrible. But we learned that there are these sequence of, sequences of notes. My muting's horrible. But these are things that translate back to the guitar. So once I've figured some of these ideas out, this is where the big payoff happened. So back to the guitar, I can now retranslate what I picked up from the dobro back to the guitar. So remember, with some determination and out-of-the-box thinking, we can always find ways to continue playing, practicing, and even gigging despite injury in our hands. In fact, you may end up acquiring new skills you never even imagined. In a few weeks, I'll be posting a follow-up to this video, The Django Rule Part 2, where I'll go in-depth with some strategies to keep you practicing and playing while recovering from an injury, and then taking those ideas and adapting them into your practice routine once your recovery is complete. So remember, like, share, and subscribe if you enjoy the channel's content. Comments and suggestions are always welcome. My name is Dave Holland, and thanks for watching String Them Up. And everybody, be careful, stay safe, and you know, read a good book every now and then, okay? See you next time. Bye.